Hello, welcome to Staring Into the Abyss. I'm your host, Richard Gerlach. With me, as always, is Matt Brandenburg. <laughs> Hi, this is our secret NPR talk. And always with us as well is uh, Villa May Mist. So, um, do you want to talk about this forest that a girl went into? <laughs> yeah, man, I heard I heard lots of crazy shit about this forest. What's up, everybody? It's into the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it, I wish we could have said April Fools, but it's not. It's May. It's not. <laughs> I just want to like, like the, that calm intro to them be like, "What up, everybody?" <laughs> uh, <laughs> but <laughs> today's story is going to be the Intoxicated Years by uh, Mariana. Uh, I always pronounce her last name wrong. Enriquez. I think so. Yeah, think Mariana so, yeah. Enriquez. You can read it online for free at granta.com. It is also found in her fantastic short story collection, Things You Lost in the Fire. And it is, she's an interesting writer. I'm sure we, for such a short story, we will have quite a little bit to process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and she's an author. I, if you go to check her stuff out, I recommend paying close attention to the text. Because I think nowadays we tend to kind of skim a lot. Where it's yeah, like, I, yeah. I, I don't mean skim in a bad way, but I mean like people tend to write in a way where we're just used to casually reading across the page. Where when we come where to you're someone, like, I got 20 books I need to read, so I'm going to hurry up and just skim through this so I can get to the next one. Yeah, that too. But then you come across <laughs> an author who like, they deliberately place specific sentences that feel like throwaway sentences only to come back later on in the story. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Oh, like, like she's an author. Just, you really got to pay attention to, which makes your books more dense. But I think it also makes your books a bit more rewarding than just the autopilot. Read the page that we tend yeah. to get a lot these days. I, I would agree. I just, at least this, I think is the only thing I've read of hers. And I, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there, there's there's a lot happening that you you and we'll get to it but just a lot happening off page and mm -hmm. a lot happening on page and you're you know i think we've talked about I, there was another story a couple weeks back i think we were talking about where it was sort of like a magician sleight of hand where you're looking at the left and at the right all the stuff is happening and that, this feels like that too where yeah. you're focused on things that we'll get it, into it, in a moment. It was with it was with the enchanted um, teeth, a house full of teeth. I was eating the the thief. Yes, yep. that's the one. Yes, that I was trying to yeah. remember, and I was like, I know we just did one like that, and that, this is similar to that. Where and, and Rich was telling me before the show, there, there's, it, and he pointed out some things where you're like, oh yeah, like if you think about it, you're like that totally makes sense, but. At the first time of reading, you're just like, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I, I literally had to read this story three times. I read it twice, and I got it better the second time. And then I read it the third time this morning, and I was like, oh, shit. Because I noticed a couple things I didn't notice the first two times. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it really kind of, a lot of stuff there sneaks up on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But before we dive into this, why don't we go into our media recommendations? Yeah. Um, it has been the release of Gardens of the Galaxy 3 this Friday, which I have not seen yet. I have not um, either. I haven't either. I'm, I might. I'm kind can of you, Can you, like, you guys hear the, the less of a hype in our voices? <laughs> <laughs> like, We're I really so... do. I, I think I'm going to see it today. Uh, but yeah. I'm I'm but, gonna see it this this weekend, but okay. it might be the last Marvel movie I see for a while. Yeah, <laughs> just because I don't it think looks I'm gonna. Good. I don't think I'm gonna see a lot of like Marvel movies in the like in the cinemas. Yeah, yeah. I'm really for streaming for most of them. I just yeah. I don't know. I feel it it's, be it's just, just a, it's just the fatigue. Guardians. Yeah, it's just the fatigue, man. We we yeah. we are kind of we want something else like give me darker fucking stuff from them <laughs> yeah. i would love that well yeah. that's why i'm kind of excited for blade but i'm still a little bit worried that they're gonna go the campy side of it 
Yeah. And I'm like, and I don't want that because Blade is awesome. It's one of my favorite films. And I'm like, you, if you screw that up, I will be so pissed. <laughs> <laughs> because Blade is a fucking awesome character. Yeah. Man, those those first two Blade movies are awesome. Mm-hmm. I love them. I actually, yeah, I, I've been meaning to to watch them again. I I watched the first one, like, recently, and then I was like, oh, my God, I forgot how much Blade 2 is amazing. <laughs> it has Ron Perlman, for fuck's sake. Right. That guy is a yes. national treasure. Agreed. <laughs> And, this that is, and in that same vein, now I like, and now I need to watch all the Hellboy movies again because he was amazing in that. <laughs> I was trying to remember: is Blade Two? Is that Del Toro? Yeah, Blade Two is yeah, Del Toro. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I then I was watch. the third one gave us dead the first Deadpool, right? Yeah. yeah. Kind of. I mean, like he wasn't in costume or anything, but no, it was, it was basically Wade. Yeah, it was Wade yeah. Wilson, but with a pseudonym. Yeah. 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 He basically is like, Shh, don't tell anyone I'm in another Marvel movie. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? I'm just, I don't know. For me, like, I love the Blade movies a lot, but, um, shit, I was going to say something, but it left my head, so never mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Marvel know, is doing to you about, right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Marvel movies have burned me out. And I was going to say is, um, I used to love the Hellboy movies. And then I decided to read the Hellboy comics. Mm. And now I can't watch the movies anymore. I, I, can, I mean, I can understand that, yeah. Like, I mean, they are completely different. They, the, the, the comic, it's actually my favorite comic series of all time. Yeah, I mean, Mike Manola, he, he, like, the art that he does is amazing. Yeah. Oh, 100%. And the story is just so good. And, like, mm -hmm. they, they went from... Because in the comic, Hellboy is more of this kind of, like doomed man type figure who's a bit more oh, cynical. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's not, like, like he's like an anti-hero. In the movie, they made him a bratty teenager. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I'm just like, and like, it's funny in the movie, and I was a kid when I saw him in theaters, and I was like, I loved it. But um, it's just kind of funny going from how he's originally portrayed to this bratty kid that we see in the movie. And then in the new Hobbit movie they do, David Harbour, they still kept it the same bratty kid persona. I yeah thing. I didn't um I didn't see that one I was like for me I was like no the only one who can actually like really funly portray Hellboy is Ron Perlman <laughs> because you yeah. saw you because you saw how much he enjoyed being that guy yeah oh he had like, a blast as that he, guy yeah he had so much fun he did not mind sitting in the chair for six hours getting this paint on because he was like this guy this character i love this character he's my favorite <laughs> like he did not mind that and i'm like yeah props to you man because i would have died of boredom being in that chair for six hours <laughs> <laughs> well why don't we dive into our movies and our recommendations or non-recommendations <laughs> for this week yeah. yeah my first one i saw the other night is kids versus aliens nice on shutter which final guys just did so it feels yeah. like we're on final guys wavelength again yeah um that wasn't planned after i saw the movie i saw final guys did an episode on it recently that's uh, so funny it's okay yeah it's I, I kind of see how Jason Brandt saw it in the Final Guys, where like it feels like you're watching a movie you would have made if you were in middle school. That's fair. Using logic that you'd use if you were in middle school. <laughs> um, but that being said, did I have fun? Yes. Was it a bit too much at times? Yes. <laughs> were the effects pretty good? Yeah, they were decent. Like it's it, it's a fun movie if you're looking for kind of like coming of age summer of eighty four kids being little shits and <laughs> running off against a sadistic bully who can get into a girl's pants just by giving her a look <laughs> like <laughs> like I said like literally part of the movie is like um the kids are making a movie with this is the beginning the kids are making a movie with their sister. And their sister's doing wrestling moves and stuff for the movie. The bully and his friends come and sees their little, like, area. It's like, oh, this would be great for a party. 
and the kids are just like, shut the fuck up. We'll get the fuck out of here. That's our place. And then the bully hits the kid on the side of the head with a bottle, breaks a bottle on his head, Jeez. then gives the sister a wink. And she's forgotten about caring about her brother. And she's like, wow, this guy's really cute. And like, none of it makes sense, logically speaking. But like, yeah. if you were a kid, it would make sense. Yeah. So that's why I'm kind of like, it feels like it's a movie that is using kid logic. And if you look at it that way, it's, it's a fun time. But if you try to look at it as like, people don't act like this, then you're not going to have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, in the movie, so pretty much what it is, is these group of kids are making a low budget backyard movie with their sister. This bully comes with his friends he wants to throw a raging house party, but doesn't have a place to throw it. And she tries seducing the sister to get inside her house to use her house for his big house rager. And while all this is happening, aliens are kidnapping people. And while the rager is happening, aliens break into the house and begin kidnapping people and taking them and abducting them. And using them and killing them and all the fun stuff. Uh, <laughs> and the, the the idea is like they 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 tie these people up with these tables and pour this liquid on them that melts their flesh into goop that fly that falls into the ship, which is their fuel source. Nice. It is very stupid. <laughs> um, it's on Shutter. If you want to, if you want to watch it be my guest it's not the best movie in the world it's not the worst movie in the world if you're a stoner i definitely recommend partaking before seeing the movie because i think it'll enhance the experience oh, there you but go. it is not really a great movie i also have you guys ever read the uh, hugh howley books the silo books no i've always been meaning to me, because me I, because too. I, because never... I love post-apocalyptic sci-fi stories. Me too. I have the first one. I bought the first one like six years ago. Still haven't read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, because it's a, it's an interesting process with uh, that story because it started as a short story. Yeah, it was like a serialized like novella or short story thing. That then they got put into books. Yeah. Um, and then and, the, and, and, he, and he publishes it through... Uh, you know, Amazon Kindle Press, like KBD, uh, KDB. Yep. And it just got like a huge, it went on to be a huge success. And did you guys know they turned into a TV show? I just <laughs> found out this morning. When I messaged I, I saw, you I, no, Discord? <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, no. I saw it on TikTok. I'm following a guy on TikTok who does like these uh, new movies, uh, new like movie news or like new TV shows news. And uh, yeah, he was talking about that, and he said like this is gonna be like he's so he's so he was so surprised that no one was talking about this season because to him it felt like it was a Westworld season one good. Wow. Yeah, so, and I was like, oh, the hype is good. Okay, I need to check it out. <laughs> so the reason why I mentioned this is I woke up this morning and I turned on my Apple, like my iPad, and it mm. just said. A silo premiere now available and i was like wait they turned silo into a tv series mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been, like it has been like in the talks for a long like, long I had, time i had i had no idea because no one been talking about it so i had no idea so i watched the first two episodes and again how do i not know this is a show tim robbins is in it mm -hmm. rashida jones is in it Mm -hmm. Rebecca Ferguson's in it like mm -hmm. comments in it like they got a lot of big people like how have I not heard of this show I know right <laughs> because there's such oversaturations of shows now yeah. like, all the good ones like the people that people should be paying attention to they get buried under all the reality TV Love Island shit shows yeah <laughs> I agree with that so I watched the first two episodes of Silo this morning. And, and if you're wondering how I had time to, to read and watch this morning, I woke up at six. <laughs> but, oh <my> okay. <laughs> uh, so Silo was fucking great. 
and I can't wait till next Friday for the next episode to drop because I am I am hooked. Okay. Um, wait, is this is on. Yeah, it, what I is this on? It's on Apple it's on TV. Apple TV. Uh, okay. It takes place in the post-apocalyptic future, where everybody lives in this underground bunker, and they're led to believe the outside air is toxic. Yeah. Which is why okay. they can't leave. And it doesn't seem like there's there, some people kind of paranoid about some stuff going on, but overall it doesn't seem like that bad. And they're having a celebration for what I guess would be a dystopian liberation day where <laughs> like 140 years ago, a rebel group tried to break the order of the silo and open the door to let people out because they believed that they're being lied to or the outside air was fine and the rebellion was stopped and the silo was kept closed. So people were able to stay safe and not breathe the toxic air from the outside. And they kind of celebrate the squashing of this rebellion and the whole time. And you're wondering like, is the outside air really toxic? Is it what things seem like? What's really, what's the truth? What's, what's being lied to. And you follow a couple of the first episode the perspective changes in episode two. But in the first episode, you're following a couple who have been permitted to copulate. They've been permitted to give birth. Um, the society has strict birthing regulations due to the fact it's an underground silo and supplies yeah. are limited. So, like, they, they put an um, IUD in people, and then if they're selected to be okay for birth, they take it out. So then they, they can try to get pregnant and add to the population of the silo. And um, while this is happening, our Rashida Jones's character begins getting curious about these deleted documents that deal with the history of the silo. And she gets caught up in the idea that they're being lied to, that something really different's going on. And it begins to turn her life and her husband's life upside down as it kind of spirals out of control. That sounds yeah, yep, good. Yep. This is something I need to check out. Is how, is how like are they so are there how big is this space? It's fucking huge. Okay, <laughs> it's, and, it's massive. <laughs> it's just like a, just picturing size, and so they've been there for over 140 years. Yes, crazy. Okay, and I, I will say this: if you go to to the authorities or the person in charge and say that you want to leave, you can leave. But, and I will say, everyone who leaves, because people have left before, everyone has access to a window. And the window projects the same image for everybody, because the silo's underground, so the window's a camera. So it projects the same image for everybody. And they see the bodies of the three previous people who tried to leave. Oh. So what it is, is, like, everyone who tries to leave, they, they step outside, they go to the camera, they clean the camera off, and then they start walking into the distance and then they fall down and stop moving. Okay. But I'm glad they cleaned also, the camera off. There's a reason for that that I, I won't spoil. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, part of your job is to do maintenance before you leave. Well, no, what it is is so okay, this is this is a slight spoiler. Is it you don't have to, you don't have to spoil it. I like to imagine my <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll just say this. The image they see in the camera isn't really what the outside world looks like. Yeah, I kind of had a feeling that was the case. Um, and so, but what's real and what's fake is kind of to be interpreted as the as the series moves on. Um, nice. and then episode two, this the changes focus to Rebecca Ferguson's character. And she is beginning appointed to become the new sheriff. And is kind of learning the secrets of the silo. Cool. And it just ended with her realizing the silo was a lot bigger than they originally thought it was. I like it. Mm -hmm. so, like, Wait, I so have neither of you have read have, have neither of you have read this? I, no, I, I like I remember when I like I saw it in the stores and I read through the back cover, like I, I read the blurb and I was like, this is Amazing. Looks uh, like it is definitely my jam. Like, but I 
for some reason, I didn't buy it. I don't know why. Maybe that's because I was on a saving spree. I'm like, I can't buy books right now. <laughs> and it was before Kindle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay. I, like, books are ridiculously, ridiculously expensive here. So, yeah. Uh, I, I think, think that I think that might have been why. I got a copy at a used bookstore. Oh, nice. But I never, I never read it. I don't know why. It, it, it always sounded interesting to me, and mm-hmm. I've always like wanted to read it. But something else always started. I started something else in place of it, so I still haven't read it. Yeah, it, yeah. it always happens. Okay. But the the show's great, and I think I might try to dig up my copy and read the book because I'm 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 loving what I'm seeing of the show so far. Nice. And then. <laughs> This is my question of Vit LeMay. I have a few more that I'm done. Okay. Um, have you seen Fire on Mars yet, Vit LeMay? I know you're the animation person here. <laughs> have I seen what? Fired on Mars. Nope. It is on HBO Max. Well, I, ha- I, haven't, I haven't been using your access lately, so... <laughs> if you want to use my access anytime, but it's on HBO yeah. Max. It takes place in the future where this company called Marsley is expanding operations into Mars and they build the Mars colony and our main character who's voiced by Luke Wilson uh, what? yep (laughs) wow oh that's Owen Wilson's the wow oh fuck yeah yeah but still but still still, I didn't know Luke was into voice acting yeah Luke Wilson's Luke Wilson's Owen Wilson's brother yeah, I and know that. <laughs> he's doing he's doing the voice acting in this with some other big name actors. Um, and pretty much he plays this guy who gets sent to Mars as the graphic designer for the company, and then they determine his job is irrelevant and they eliminate no shit. His- <laughs> so now he's laid off on Mars. Nice. And Mars is the only place to live on Mars. So he's kind of aimless living in this corporate that's kind of punching him down every time he tries to get a foot up. Hmm. And it's like a commentary on kind of modern life. Like part of it feels like BoJack Horseman where they're trying to tackle kind of like not so much mental illness, but more the the repetition of adult modern life and how like people are trying to find a purpose, but a lot of people struggle in finding a purpose of what they want. It gets into a lot of stuff like that as like an adult comedy, pretty much. Um, it gets pretty fucking dark at a few points, but <laughs> <laughs> like there's some stuff in the, the first four episodes that was like, fuck, you actually went there. OK, cool. <laughs> like there's there's one part where he gets punished for and his punishment is to be sent to the sleep tank where <laughs> he's going to be sent to the sleep tank to be just be put in the sleep tank and sleep for two years. <laughs> and. So he says, fuck that. And he begins to try to escape onto the surface of Mars and he fails. And he wakes up two months later in the sleep tank because the people who put him in the sleep tank didn't bother to drain his, his bladder before they put him in because they didn't care and they weren't paying attention and they threw him in the sleep tank and then in about two months, his bowels released, and he was drowning in his own defecation <laughs> in the sleep tank, and they had to get him out. And the whole episode, his face is bruised, and his eye is blood red, and he's bleeding wow. from his eye for most of the episode. Oh, as my God. <laughs> <goes on>. Damn. <laughs> That's messed up. <laughs> it's really messed up. It's a good, it's a, it's a really good show so far. Like, I'm really enjoying it. Um. It, it's it seems pretty grounded, and then every episode just ends in the wildest cliffhanger, and you're just like, "What the <laughs> fuck?" But I, I'd recommend reading Fire on Mars. Not reading, watching Fire on Mars. It's it's a pretty good time. And I'll skip Anime Corner this week, and <laughs> I, will, I will just say I finished reading Small Mercies by Dennis Lehane, and nice. I've moved on to Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. But oh, yes. Small Mercies by Dennis Lehane is one of it's probably Dennis Lehane's best book. It's definitely his best book since Mystic River. 
and it's one of the best books I've read so far this year. It's not horror, but it's pretty it's pretty fucking dark. Um, I talked about it last week, I think. Yeah. yeah. And there's like the end of the book, literally, the more you read this book, the more it feels like a powder keg that's about to go off in your hands. <laughs> like it just it just feels like it's going to explode. But um Mary Pat, despite her her racism and her hot headedness is one of the most compelling characters I've ever read in a book. Hmm. Um, like she was such a fantastic voice to just hear the story through and the twists and turns the story takes were very intriguing and really kept, kept things going. Like I'll like the small spoiler I'll give, which is kind of obvious if you pay attention to the subtext, but the black kid who dies was killed by Mary Pat's daughter. <laughs> and so Mary Pat goes to the funeral of um that kid to give her condolences because she worked with the kid's mother. And she always respected the kid's mother, so she went in to kind of give her condolences. And the mother's like, I don't like you. I've never liked you. I've always been nice to you, but I've never liked you. And the way you people talk about people like me, and I am not going to accept your apology. <laughs> and Mary Pat's like, I understand. It's okay. And like kind of leaves. And she's like, I just want to pay my respect. You don't need to accept my apology. I understand the damage I've done. That's crazy. As she like goes to leave. And like in the book, she realizes like there's a big um part of the end of the book where she's having a talk. And she realizes, like, when she was a child, her parents told her all these lies about other people. And, like, black people, Jewish people, Polish people. And when you're a kid, at first when people tell you this stuff, you think it's bullshit. But they keep on telling you this stuff. And they're your family. And they give you, they provide you warmth. They provide you comfort. So you should believe what they say, even if deep down you know it's bullshit, because it's the way, and the way seems much better than being out in the cold, because the way has your family. And then you grow up, and you have a family, and you pass the same beliefs on to your kids, because it was what's passed on to you, because it's a way to give your own kids comfort as well, or you believe it's giving them comfort, until it goes and it goes and it goes and it goes, and you're responsible for turning one of the kids into a murderer because they believe these horrible things about black people. <laughs> and like, um, she has this kind of speech at the end of the book that like, it was really powerful because she realizes by the end, like the damage her own racism has done to her family and her daughter and her own life. That sounds intense. <laughs> it's really intense. <laughs> it's a great good. Yeah. No, it's it's a really great book. Um, I think it's it's not as I think Mystic River might be Dennis Lehane's best plotted book. I'm I, I'm still waiting for a book as tightly plotted as Mystic River because that book is so intricate and like perfect. But the emotional highs that Small Mercies has are some of the most emotional highs that Dennis Lehane's ever written. Like it's just a really intense read that powers itself through. Very cool. And I'd, I'd recommend it if you're into, into crime fiction or you want to get, read some crime fiction, visit, visit South Boston in 1974 with Dennis Lehane when the busing crisis happened because um, people were super racist and want black kids going to white schools. It's a good time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, no, I, seriously, though, Small Mercies is great. And also, I'm about halfway through Blood Meridian, and I'm loving it. But Matt, what about you? <laughs> yes. All right. So I read uh, Ryan C. Bradley's Saint's Blood, which I think came out. I, don't know, I, I have literally have the book in front of me. I could tell you when it came out. So last year. <laughs> so, anyway, this is uh, I had an absolute blast with this story. It's it's a it's a kidnapping story uh, where we are first person through a professor that lives in, it's like an Oklahoma kind of area. And 
he is Richie is his name and Richie have his his like great 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 grandfather was like a saint um from Mexico who was killed and he must have told somebody in his class because the next thing you know is this big burly redneck family kidnaps him and wants to steal his saint's blood to help one of their siblings. They believe his sibling's blood will cure, or they believe the professor's blood will cure this sibling of cancer. And so they kidnap him and they bring him to, which we find out very quickly, their house. They all wear different president masks. So one's in a Nixon mask, one is in a Trump mask, and one is in a Reagan mask. And they um, kind of like sort of torture him. They only one of them really isn't enjoying this kidnapping. The other two kidnappers are not fans of doing it, but are doing it because they need to help their brother as much as they can. And so they like they kind of feel guilty every time they go in the room and and make him do things and steal his blood and everything like that. But then he also doesn't make it easy for them. He's a little bit of a smart ass. Um, he doesn't, he's not strong. He's not very, I mean, like he's a professor, but he's not like the most smartest person. So he doesn't know how to watch his mouth and says lots of things to these kidnappers that usually make them pretty mad. And all the while he's kind of trying to figure out like, he's he's re- he's remembering for us like who the the stories he heard about the saint who was you know the people tried to kill this saint multiple times and he never died because he's i don't know a saint and so like he's trying to figure out like the truth and the fiction of it all and trying to figure out if he actually has this blood and why can't he have some of these power saintly powers to get out and it's just uh, I'm laughing because throughout it all, it's just this, it's sort of done comically, uh, not full on like Danger Slater, Brian Asman kind of comic stuff that yeah. we've read. But it's still very humorous being in this guy's head and listening to him talk and then seeing these these big dudes try to figure things out and try to make it work. And they're all kind of like coming to him individually either for advice or to apologize and all, it's just like this comedy of errors and uh, as the story progresses we get a uh, little vignettes of the character's mom or, or of the kidnapper's mom and we realize that she doesn't know the they have a kidnapped person in the house and so she's got she figures it out but she's not friendly about this either she's at this point like well we kidnapped him we might as well finish him off uh, um so it i loved it it's an absolute blast it it's it's very interesting like it's a good thought process and like what would happen if you were kidnapped then you you know that the reason they kidnapped you is kind of idiotic and at the same time it's We've read so many, and this isn't a hit at any of them because it's all the a lot of them are really good. But we've read so many female being kidnapped and kidnappers, that whole story. So it was kind of fun to get this flip on the story and have a, a have it be a male just to kind of see what that perspective would be like. And he's not your alpha tough guy thing. Like I said, he's a smart ass, but he's not like he he's not powering powering through and and john wicking his way through this house or anything like that a lot of bad things happen to this guy he's he is not safe through this story uh, um so it, i thought it was just a kind of fascinating look at that kind of like a little bit of a flip on that and like how you would think of like a a regular person would handle this type of situation especially if they're a little bit of a smart ass um so I have a question. Great. Yes. Does he do a die hard? Uh <laughs> no, he does not do a die hard. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> no. There I I don't want to spoil the ending cuz I think the ending is great and I think it's definitely worth hunting this book down. I don't think a lot of people are talking about it. 
uh, he was at Ghoulish, and so that's where I got it from. I hadn't honestly hadn't heard about it until it being there, but it what's it intrigued. what's it called again? It, it's called Saints Blood by uh, Ryan C. Bradley, and I definitely people need to read this. It's it's great. <laughs> I just I loved it. Um, so yes, that was one, and then I'll just be real quick because I this was just a thing, but I had, I read this, uh, star Wars book. That's one of the legacy books. So it, I, like right from the start, I was kind of like, well, do I even need to read this? It really has nothing to do now with the expanded world of star Wars, but I was like, I bought it. I might as well read it. Um, it's called the last tribe of the Sith or Lo- yeah. Lost tribe of the Sith. And the concept is fascinating. This group of, Sith people land on uh, a uh, crash land on a planet and due to you know space stuff they can't contact their people and so now they're trapped and there are there's life on this planet and they are Sith so they quickly overrun these people and make them their slaves and the rest of the story <laughs> so like that's all beginning part but the fascinating part is this idea of a tribe of sith people that have at this point no one to conquer and nothing to do and so it's just their constant battles between each other and like each of them go vying for power and how they do that and so i was like well that's fascinating it's that kind of idea of like if you put a bunch of terrible people in a place where are they going to do and they're going to be terrible but the only people they can be terrible to is to each other and so you're like cool uh, um so the idea is great i was like this is cool the way it's written it just like blew my mind because in you never see the whatever's the big events you're just getting the after event and then people thinking about what happened and not like recapping, so you're si- kind of seeing it, just being like, "Oh man, that that war was crazy," and then you just move on to some rando story about somebody farming or something like that, and you're just like, "Wait, you t- <laughs> like, I'm, you can't just tease something like huge like that." It, but it, it just for a Star Wars book, you kind of want one thing and you get something else, and it was not in a way that's cool. You're like, "Oh, you know, I love this idea of." of focusing on these little things. It was just, was just kind of frustrating thing where you're, you're always getting a tease, but never getting the story. And then at one point it switched to kind of like an Asimov's foundation. So I know there's a show I haven't seen the show, but I've read all the books. So I, the idea of somebody in the past giving you these clues on how to survive in the future. I love that idea. They sort of give that here where they had like some original Sith people on this planet and they're like, oh, they got some secret message that will get revealed in 2000 years. And so all these people are ready for it and it gives them a clue to move on. But again, like when you kind of get that, it didn't do anything cool with that. So anyway, sort of disappointed with it. Had some great ideas that would have been cool to explore more. Um, but yeah. <laughs> that was my disappointment read for the week. And I think we'll end it on a disappointment. All right. And Vitlame, what about you? Well, v- this week has also been crazy as fuck. <laughs> so <laughs> I haven't done a whole lot of consuming lately, like media consuming. We we continue on with um with the Mandalorian. Oh, but yeah. I think, I th- but I think I just finished just one or two more episodes i can't remember i i we just finished the episode where we've got a little like a little peek into grogu's past yes which was really interesting and i really like that jedi and i know and i know who that guy is like who the actor is yeah old jar jar Mm -hmm. i'm at best (laughs) i just that's just me in the ska band really (laughs) <laughs> Scott, fun fact of the podcast: I throw them in when I can. Yes, you do. I had no idea. But yeah, it was really, it was really nice seeing him there, and he got such a badass role because I had heard that because he was slammed for portraying Jar Jar, 
that he was almost driven to suicide. Yeah. 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 He was, he was in a really dark place. Like after, after a lot of that stuff. I mean, I don't think, I mean, for, unfortunately he wasn't the only one. I mean, Jake Lloyd also got his, uh, his slamming as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's sad <laughs> to like, because he's a fucking about... little boy. Right. Well, and it's sad to think about like whenever the, um, the last Jedi came out and how they, everyone did that to um, Rose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't, but, it, and it's like, man, if you kind of like look back, people, Star Wars fans have been doing that for 15 plus years. Yes. It's some terrible toxic. And so, there I go talking toxic, bad about a book. So. It's just a toxic fan. <laughs> well, it's like, People wonder why George Lucas sold Star Wars to Disney. Mm-hmm. He wasn't having fun anymore. Like, yeah. <laughs> Star Wars to him was just him having fun. He wanted to tell a Flash Gordon space samurai story and yeah. have a time doing it. And it was all meant to be just fun. And the, the all the backlash he got from the prequels, I don't even think the prequels are bad movies. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I don't like them. But I, I wouldn't say they're like the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. I think the the main issue is he overexplained things too much for them. But, I think um, so, yeah. That might that might be it. But I you, you can and just and, like, and, and just the dry um, direction, basically. Yeah. Like and the all poor, the, the poor the, the yeah, the poor the poor actors, they just I mean, they're not bad actors. They just got directed really poorly. Yeah. I hate sand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um no, like he obviously was having fun with the property anymore. Like why wouldn't he sell it? He doesn't yeah. care. Yeah. Like yeah. he even said it's not fun for him because of all the shit that he got. And if you think about like the original movies too, George Lucas only directed the first one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Like other people directed the others. So yeah. it's uh, it, it's one of those things where it's like George Lucas was having a fun time with the movies, but the fandom is just way too much. Like, yeah, I don't is. know what it is like about Star Wars that just makes people so fucking defensive and angry all the time. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I don't. It was, okay, I, I mean, I grew up watching this, but I still enjoy that they are expanding like the lore. Yeah, I like I like that, and I also like that they were like bringing other people that you didn't see in the original movies, like in Rogue One, uh, the blind Jedi. I'm like, holy fucking crap! Can I have more of that? I love that guy. <laughs> Rogue One, <laughs> such a good movie. I love it. Yeah, it's it's my best, like it's my favorite and best Star Wars movie in my opinion. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but they had like they had so many interesting things. Like they had. A blind Jedi, for example, and another guy, like his companion, and the, it was just that. It was like they were, like they were companions, and you didn't yeah. have to go, you didn't have to go anything further than that. And they had such a really great bond, and I'm like, this is great. Just go with this, and yep. don't and don't think about it too much. And especially with Rose, I didn't mind her at all. I liked her. No. Yeah. And then or, just seeing the backlash of her, I'm like, what the hell? What's going on? It's not her fault. It's the director's fault. Or, like, how the direction was. Or, like, how the script was changed. Or, like, yeah. um, even even with, like, John Boyega and Kelly Marie Tran, like, they were poster people for, the first, for, like, the first and second movie. Yeah. And for the third movie, they were in it for, like, what, five minutes? Yeah. yeah. I like didn't was, understand that because I loved that concept of like a stormtrooper who was like, you know, rebelling basically. Yeah, no, I, yeah. that was a great concept. Yeah. Well, and again, it's like like we've been saying with these recent Marvel movies, those three Star Wars movies, they were I enjoyed them, but there wasn't it, it felt like a game of even the third corpse. one. That? <laughs> the third one, you know, I, well, anyway, <laughs> it, it, it felt like a game of of them not having a complete idea yeah. to run over a trilogy. And I know they put what's his name, J.J. Abrams, and he directed the, the first of the new and then the third of the new. But yeah. like still the fact that they didn't um, have like a complete 
arc to tell. Mm-hmm. Felt like they had ideas. Like you, I mean, you've like you said, they, the they had storm ideas. Super rebellion but, and yeah, they had ideas, but it was like they they, they felt like they held this had this co- compulsion to piggyback on the nostalgia of the other of the other films. Yeah. And, and, I, and I like, don't and I don't mind that, but but you can always just sprinkle a little bit of like a nostalgia. For example, like seeing like in the trailer when you saw the Millennium Falcon, you were like, okay, this is amazing. But yeah. that 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 could have just been it because that was enough for us. Yeah. We didn't I, have but, to rehash the fucking first movie. Yeah. <laughs> I also anyway, feel so, like the Last Jedi is better than people give it credit for. Yeah, I think it's I think it, and it it's. The way, the way like everything is you give it a couple more years and everyone's gonna love it and so mm, yeah. I, it's just one of those things i think people need to sit with it i enjoyed it i like the way the direction and i like the ending and the cool silent explosion scene and everything like that all that, that was, was amazing that was amazing scene <laughs> so uh yeah i think it, it, it yeah and again like you're getting teases of things that are happening that they don't explore later and like uh, all this stuff but anyway you were yeah. you were talking about mandalorian <laughs> yeah yes. yeah i i finished yeah i finished that one i really enjoyed seeing like how like the importance of him and you're go you're getting like a little bit more information like okay that that he might be the new hope yeah and I, I like that, but it was also kind of funny to see. Uh, th- like, they both have really great practical effects on Grogu, but then at the same time, they also have really bad practical effects. Yeah. It was like it was, they were switching between bad and good, and I just kept noticing it. I'm like, wow, so th- <laughs> there is a time that they just threw a puppet in the air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, and so you haven't finished it yet? I haven't finished it yet. No, I like okay, I said, I, have, just, I uh, <laughs> haven't had time. All I these mean, comments I, are cracking me up. Just wait, <laughs> just wait. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, next <laughs> next week we're gonna have a field day. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking about a part, and I'm thinking of what you're saying now, and I'm like, oh man, you're gonna have some funny things to say soon. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, then I finished one novella. Um. I think I, I actually just like after we after we stopped recording on like last Saturday, I just like had the sudden urge because I was talking about Ari Busby and her uh, short story Holes, and I was yeah. like, oh, like oh man, I need to read her uh, novella that just came out, like Corporate Body, and I just oh, went yeah. online and I got it and I just started reading it immediately, and I What'd just bla- I blazed through it. It was amazing. <laughs> nice. I just, I read it in one sitting, and that usually doesn't happen with me because I'm such a slow reader. But, <laughs> like, she puts a really nice voice to the uh, to the story. It's, like, really, uh, it's both really fast-paced, and you you just, like I said, you breeze through it. And this, But this, it's really, really unnerving. It has a lot of body horror in it. <laughs> a lot of worms. So, so, so if you're icky about <laughs> worms, this might not be your thing. But I, I, I kind of love the thing that she decided to um, talk. Like, it's kind of centers about about a guy who's like down on his luck. Uh, he needs the money. Uh, he's just living in a shed basically because rent is too high, and um, he like needs to find some like money fast to you know afford this rent on the sh- on the shed. And just to make a living, basically, like to basically just to fucking survive. And I kind of related to this. I was like, well, I'm not, I mean, I'm not in a financial that kind of financial situation, but you know what's happening around the world, and cue the fucking coronation that's happening in the in the UK right now. It just actually finished, I think. And um, by the time we, uh, but by the time we air this, it's already already finished. It's like you yeah. spent fucking hundred million pounds. Just to put a fucking hat on a guy, which was already king, by the way. He didn't really need to do that. I'm wi- I'm waiting for King Charles to stand up and go, Hail Pyman. Yes. <laughs> Hail Pyman. Yeah. And it's just like, well, well, there are like uh, one guy, like I saw on, I think on TikTok, like one guy did like a Google search just for um, food banks in the UK. 
and it just covered the entire country. Oh, wow. Yeah, that says a lot. It's like, you could have spent that money to help the fucking poor, not to establish the rich more, you yeah. assholes. And that that story kind of resonated with me because, you know, he was just doing whatever, uh, trying to scrunch off some money. And he decided, like, the best way for him to do that was to become a human test subject. <laughs> you know, just to go to various pharmaceutical companies and just try out some drugs or some creams to see if it's something would happen. And uh, he would usually get a lot of, like, money for it. Not, not a lot, but not to make him, you know, come by. And then he has, like, it's basically he comes upon this break. Like, this is the money shot. It's like, you're going to spend a couple of months on this facility, and they're going to pay you, like, they're going to pay you so much money that you don't really have to worry about money anymore. <laughs> and even, I mean, if that sounds too good to be true, you should never have to fucking do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then, but then again, this is a horror story, so Yeah. <laughs> And he and another guy he befriended, uh, like, in this, like, tested facility, they do it. And um, what's different about this testing facility is that something is, is inserted into them. Like, they have, a, they have a minor surgery. Something is inserted into them, like, below, like in the lower abdomen, like, below the navel. Uh-oh. And they have to be like like monitored to see the progress of what's happening. And uh, boy, does Ari Busby go into details like <laughs> to make you really uncomfortable because this is like this is written in the first person uh, per, uh, point of view, which I really like. And he keeps mentioning like because this is supposed to be his like uh, diary. Or like journal, like while he was there, and he's just basically cataloging what whatever what happened before and then during, and then then it's like the leaves of like, hey, if you find this, um, you're you're lucky, you know what's happening there. <laughs> um, and he just really just put pull, put out these psychosomatic symptoms that actually kind of burrows into your brain. It's like the first Ooh. the first sentence in that in that story actually says like, ah, oh, you know when you have to like when you have that itch, and then and then it just starts to say, oh yeah, by the way, you're thinking about scratching, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 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 you you just you you're trying to fight it, but you know once you go with that with your fingernails on your skin and you start scratching, it's the best thing in the fucking world. And I had to resist so much to scratch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was like, my head started to itch, and I'm like, I'm not scratching, I'm not scratching, I'm gonna keep reading on, I'm not scratching this. <laughs> Here we go. How many listeners are scratching right now? <laughs> Most definitely all of them. <laughs> Me. Yeah. <laughs> and it just, yeah, it goes into detail, like when, like, after the surgery, like what happens to his body, uh, mostly actually what happens to the people, other people before him. And then he would like he experienced it himself, and it just goes like into body horror really, really fast, and then it goes into weird horror in the end. Nice. And I and I really like that. It was like interesting that the, the shift basically went there instead. And uh, yeah, I <laughs> I really like this story. It's short. It's about what 120 pages, maybe. It's like it's it's short, but it's like it's fast. You go through it. You get so uncomfortable with the body horror, and the way she describes, like, "Hey, you need a you, you need a itch to scratch," and I'm like, eh, I'm "Stop that!" <laughs> and then it just goes into weird horror territory, and yeah, it's just it's really good. Oh, I love it. Yeah, definitely. Like, great. If, if, like if you're in a, like a like a reading slump, which I've been basically in, this is definitely gonna help you pull you out of it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm glad it worked for you. It did, yeah. I'm super happy. Yeah, that sounds amazing. All right. Well, I think it's time for us to um, enter Argentina. And it's <laughs> many political turmoils over the last <laughs> few years. And mm -hmm. do lots and lots of drugs. <laughs> oh, yes. At such a young age. 
<laughs> yes, that was like I, my first thing. I was like, how young are these mm. girls? <laughs> it looks like in the first section, they're like about getting into like middle school, like late middle school to mm-hmm. early high school. Yep, they, they, they be young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... so the oh, Used by Mariana Enriquez. What did you guys think of this one? <laughs> I, would, I would call it a little bit of like, like at, at a first read, I would call it maybe soft horror. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's more soft horror than it is like explicit. It's a like the stuff is left to the, to the sideline. Yeah. Well, and it's sort of like, um, like, a like a, like a real life horror of watching these kids, like we literally just said, these young mm-hmm. young girls, like just do just so much stuff, and you're just like, it, so it's that real life horror of like seeing somebody's life. Just you're like, these people aren't gonna make it mm-hmm. very long, <laughs> or if they are, they're gonna have like a horrible yeah. future. Yeah, yeah, this is a yeah. realistic coming of age story, definitely. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> But, but with, with like, but like, but that it doesn't have it doesn't have this kind of like uh, the heroic resolution that usually comes no. with coming of age. Yeah, no. I mean, there, there, there. I will say there is some kind of paranormal elements in the story. Yes, but they're very, they're very, they're subtle. They're easy to miss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, like, because the, yeah. the main part is on these girls and just all the drugs. Yeah. Yes, and. Also, like, I I love how you will get these things where it's like they're talking about the um, all the all the electricity went off for six hours at a time Mm -hmm. because of like inflation and all that stuff. But that doesn't matter to us. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're not adults. Exactly. Like, so I, I like how we get that whole thing where it's like we get the serious stuff that's happening in Argentina. But these kids like, yeah, but fuck that. We don't care. Yeah. yeah, they they know like, better. Their yeah. parents are stupid. Everyone's yeah. stupid for this whining about these things. We don't care that the that the money is now going to be equal to the dollar. E- equal mm-hmm. to the dollar. That's all dumb. Yeah. yeah, and it's like, and like the, I think that creates an interesting aspect of the story because that that's the important stuff. And these kids, are like, yeah, but these drugs, the mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> I really, I really like the sprinkles of uh, Argentina's history throughout these years. Like it, it starts from 1989, and yeah. then it, then the story ends in 1994. And, yeah. And just throughout these like sections, when she, when they are like describing what they're doing, like amidst all those drug use, yeah. they <laughs> do pepper in the like what's happening in Argentina. And I remember I used to take, um, I used to take a Spanish uh, film class. Yeah, and they we went over like the chaotic Argentinian history, and it was just wild. And I'm and and I managed to watch it like through film. Like there were a lot of like there are a lot of great Argentinian films about this happening. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so like immediately when I saw like with the blackouts and with the inflation, I immediately knew like oh this is Argentina. Yeah, <laughs> like I and, and especially when they like they switch the new leader, I'm like, oh yeah, uh, you're you're saying this mildly. Yeah, <laughs> like that, like that. the that the coup was um, violent. Yeah, yeah well, and it's too. fascinating like, for listeners because it is the story is broken up in these year chunks, and it's like we're getting uh, and not like a we're not getting the full year. We're just getting these like snippets of what these girls are doing while like they've been saying with these things happening, happening. Um, and it, it's that fascinating look and I'm sure we've talked about similar kind of things before, but that idea of like, if you're a kid or if you're, in, <laughs> if you're on lots of drugs or whatever, these things, these giant, like country changing things, things that are happening you're just not even noticing or paying attention to um 
especially in these years, uh, like, because again, 1989 to 93 or four or whatever like that, you didn't have the internet. And if we even get to a point where they don't have phones and like mm-hmm. they randomly get phones and stuff like that. So you don't have that big or like thing where you would think like in some stories you that's where the focus is the focus is solely on this like change of power and what's happening to the country and this one's i i really appreciate the idea of like well these kids are just living just, their cer- yeah. they're just <laughs> they're, there they're just they're, they think it's all stupid and yeah. they think it's all dumb and they're more focused on their current to- like what their life is um so anyway it, it's a great i I am now, especially after this, I kind of want to see some of these those movies you were talking about because it's like it is fascinating. I'll now. I'll try I'll try to remember which movies I watched and I'll okay, I'll send cool. it to you because they yeah they were really really good. <laughs> yeah, um, one thing I, 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 I yeah yeah you, you um, start you start say um, Marina Enriquez, even from what I've read of our share of night, like she ties a lot of Argentinian history into her stories. Oh, I mean, cool. that makes sense, yeah. It's yeah. like, um, Our Share of Night deals with, like, Argentina in the 60s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All stuff leading up to modern day and everything, too. But, like, sh- her books are very, like, tied into Argentinians' history. And it's chaotic history, because it's yeah. a very chaotic country for its past. It, it's really, it's like, wow. It was it was depressing to learn about it, but it's also really, like, ed- like educating. yeah. Oh yeah, well, that's what's fascinating, and so yeah, but, yeah. but yeah. I, I I also like you were talking about you know they didn't have phones. Did you catch the now and now we're entering the the part where we like at a first read you don't catch this, but if you read through it again you see the things that are missing or the mm-hmm. things that are hidden between the lines. Yeah, I really enjoyed that when they were, you know, when their families were thinking of getting um, getting phones finally after the new establishment yeah. had been put up in the country, yeah. uh, they were they were promised telephones, and they and she wrote like they came unannounced, and then she put like in brackets like they would they would call first, and I'm like, how would they call when they didn't have phones? <laughs> Well, I thought that too. I thought that was really funny. She was like, I, they, they I wouldn't call, tidbit. they would just show up. Yeah, I, <laughs> I like that tidbit. It was like, yeah, it makes perfect fucking sense. But <laughs> but then but then you probably would have to read it again just to just to catch it, you know, because it yeah. was like this was because it was just an offhand comment. Yeah. <laughs> so I loved it. Yeah, and that's what like and and Rich, you can kind of go into more detail in a second because of some of the other things you had noticed. But like a lot of this, like as you're going through the story, you're really focused on these girls and they, they like go to Buenos Aires to you know party, and this leads us to like this maybe ghost person. But like even beyond that, it's each of these segments are so focused on like well we found a lady or we fi- we made friends with a rich girl because she had mm-hmm. money and she could buy us yes. drugs. Yeah. She could score us yeah. drugs. Right. Or mm-hmm. we, there's a new girl that lived on our neighbor in our neighborhood by herself. She had a bunch of crack shaped like a ball. So mm-hmm. we were doing that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so like every segment you're so, again, you're so, fo- focused. You're so focused on that. Yeah. <laughs> did you did you did you catch like like I said we we were mentioning that this is a soft horror story but there are like there are horror elements like hidden between the lines. One yeah. thing that I found really horrifying was um, when she mentioned like again such an offhanded comment like her her friend they want they if they want to stay with her friends uh, well yeah. I can't remember her name it doesn't matter. Um, they decided just like if if they were hanging out at that girl's place, they would stay in the kitchen because the her drunk dad wouldn't go there except to get ice for his wine. And she also offhandedly she mentions, oh yeah, by the way, she keeps a lock in her room so he doesn't come yeah. into yeah. her room at night. I'm like, mm, well, that's not good. And that's what I kept wondering. And we can kind of sorry, Rich, I it's keep okay, it's okay. queuing you up, but like. Especially after reading this whole thing and then like rereading it, I kept wondering 
at one point were they had were they ghosts because we get like these parts like we in the beginning like the first section they andrea one of the girls has a boyfriend that has a van that doesn't have Mm -hmm. windows in the back and they hang out in this van and he drives them around and whips them around after they've smoked pot and like they don't seatbelts or anything so they just bounce Mm -hmm. around jumble around and everything like that and then he has to like stop and kick them out every once in a while because he's afraid the cops are coming so like I had that part. You're kind of like, okay, well, is it he really a boyfriend or is he somebody that actually like kidnapped them? And then you get like the the dad part, and they kind of like t- he, she mentions the lock and she mentions the like it, it, like them cutting themselves so they would promise mm-hmm. to, like blood packed kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But then you're also mm-hmm. like, well, wait, did did they actually? stop him from doing anything and then there was like another part where they like well then there's like there's just all these parts where you're kind of each time you're kind of wondering at least i was wondering i'm like did they die at some point i mean (laughs) i mean you i i can't say for certain but the they there are clues there and when you said for example that he maybe might have kidnapped them and killed them did you do you remember the line that he said uh, that she mentioned that he was madly in love with her and he was always hoping that she would love him back? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. a good that's a good indicator of um, someone kidnapping them and yeah, especially and like you get them. these parts where they're like the parents don't they didn't know and like they didn't care they were so focused on the bigger thing happening. Which then again leads to you thinking like, all right, well, are these what like what is ha- like what is actually happening with these girls? Are they doing cer- like a certain things happening that maybe we're 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 not seeing or we're getting like an unreliable narrator that's telling us like a magical version that maybe is not that magical, but like a certain version of things that you're kind of supposed to think like well the actual thing that's happening she's sort of teasing but not telling us i mean i think it's just really up to the reader's interpretation of it yeah there's many different ways the story can be can be read yeah yeah definitely and you know the ending i'm not going to go into the ending right away but the ending also gives you gives you a little bit of a clue like like or at least another part of an interpretation of the story Yeah. yeah so um I think this is just a really multifaceted story. It's like the one with the uh, with the the teeth uh, the teeth house. It yeah. just it's written in such an offhanded way, just in such a just like a you know you're just reading about girls who are just you know they're apathetic, they just want to take drugs and just forget about what's happening with the world. But like sprinkled in between, you're getting hints that something's not right. Yeah. yeah. Like, for me, what, the one part of the stands out is when they're on the bus coming back from Buenos Aires, mm-hmm. and you have that girl that looks, the ha- that just like, looks like a witch. Mm-hmm. And she just gives, like, the bus driver this look, and he lets, yeah. her, he lets her off. Mm-hmm. And then they just go on their day, and you're like, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but part of my, part of that ties into the ending which spoiler? We'll, we'll just the whole thing ending, ending, ending. But like we'll the ending when the person who kills the guy is wearing her headband. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that ribbon. The ribbon. So the idea is kind of like they they could be ghosts. It could be kind of like a possession type thing too, with like this ribbon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where she's able to like assert her spirit into like other people's bodies. Um. It could also just be the tragic cycle of doing a shitload of drugs and yeah. realizing that things do matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like it, it all kind of ties together in a very unique way by the end, I felt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it, like, I, I just love how it's like they hit this guy in the head with scissors. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And like, oh shit, is he dead? And like, yeah. Well, whatever. I love it when it's, is he dead? And then and asked Andrea and her eyes shone like yeah. she's excited. Yeah. 
Well, that, and just even like, don't, don't they take him outside, but then they end up stabbing him? <laughs> it was yeah. so like, oh, crazy. And like, it, it, you brought up the eye thing, and that, that made, just made me kind of think there's a couple, so there's a couple different things with eyes, and then with this kind of, um, this like drug thing where they talk earlier about a hippie who was selling them pot and everything like that. And he ended up tripping out on something. And I feel like he saw a bunch of eyes. He tore his throat up. Yeah. He was like, Oh, there's eyes here. And then, then he felt like there was something trying to get into him. So he kept scratching it. And then you had that. And then you have even this punk kid that they kill she mentions, well, his eyes were all black and he was seeing stuff and he was like, they're here or something like that. And so it's like this, again, you can look at it the one way of a lot of drugs are going to mess your brain up and you're going to see things that aren't there. But then also rich, I like kind of like what you're saying and kind of kept thinking that too, is where you get the supernatural kind of thought of something, especially with the the girl that they think has this is like a witch and then the ribbon thing, you kind of get this idea of like, well, are they seeing more that actually is there? And like, is this all tied into whatever this darker thing is that's happening? It's, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's also, it's, it's like, we, we never see the moments of violence too. Yeah. yeah where it's like, it's always like, cause they, when the whole like stabbing the punk kid, right? Like they mentioned, it's a vision they had on acid. Yeah, because they're all mm-hmm. asked what yeah. happens, so they're like, "Did they really do it? Did it not happen? How did this really go down?" And it becomes this like interesting thing to think about in terms of its narrative. Mm-hmm. I mean, they definitely killed them. Like, I'm not going to say they did it, yeah. but like, <laughs> yeah. maybe it, it's a different than how it came about. How we read it on the page, you know? Yeah. But I, one thing I love about this is. The ending of the story when he goes, is he dead? Asked Andrea and her eyes shown. And then doesn't even answer that question. It's just, yeah, put a new record on back in the house, which seems so far away. Paula took the ribbon from her hair and tied it around her wrist together. She, she and I went back to the house to dance. We were waiting for Andrea to leave the boy on the ground and come back to us. So the three of us could be together once again, waving our blue fingernails, intoxicated, Dancing before the mirror that reflected no one else. Mm-hmm. See, it's, was that what you were kind of pointing at, Villa May? Yeah. That. It's yeah. <laughs> Again, it goes to like, are they real? <laughs> because this house yeah. apparently was full of people a moment ago. I think it's yeah. just also a good reflection of like, at that time, because this was such a chaotic time, there was no adult supervisors. Yeah. Or like they like the adults were just like they were like they mentioned they were being stupid or thinking of these stupid things. And like kids were just left unattended. They just didn't Literally care. With murder. Yeah, yeah. And, and like when you're reading it, you can't say that they basically became ghosts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Actually. <laughs> 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 that's, that's totally what that is and i think even if we look back at what we were talking about earlier and that broader subject of like this big thing happening in the country and these kids it's like oh yeah that maybe that was the thesis of the story yeah. i have an inkling it might be like i because i i'm not like tooting my own horn here but i was like after, because i remember from the films like they yeah like they they, they, it was just chaos on the street, man. Yeah. Well, and, and again, <laughs> like, it's like when you get these, like, chunks of their time and them going to a whole other city, you know, yeah. take the bus all day, all night kind of bus and, like. Yeah. And, and the parents wouldn't even worry about it. They're like, no, nope, we don't yeah. care. And, like, them, like, you get. The way she wakes up at one point on the bus covered in vomit, not sure who she slept with. So like mm-hmm. she just was kind of in her own world. And then even like this one rich girl, they gave her these drugs and she went so crazy that they'd like pump her stomach. And that, and it was just mm-hmm. like, well, we were no longer friends with her. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then they're hanging out with this person who's clearly selling crack. Um, and it was just so, yeah, it's this whole thing of the parents were just so focused on the bigger thing that these kids were just lost 
Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, fascinating. It's, yeah, it's such a great story. I'm happy you got. I was kind of nervous choosing it because it's such like a horror light story. <laughs> but um, I felt like it, there was enough in there for us to like dissect due to how much is kind of diverted from the reader's attention, which to mm-hmm. me is the more fascinating part of the story is like, yeah. I love stories where the actual story is off of the page. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. you're giving I, enough uh... on the page to like piece it together. I think it takes such a talent to write a story like that. Yeah, oh, totally. I agree. No, I, I, yeah, it was at first when I first was getting through it to the get to the end. I was kind of like, what? Why did we pick this? And then I got to the end. And I was like, oh, OK, I get it now. <laughs> 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 and it's, it's no. a really fun story. Like, I, I like this one a lot. I'm yeah. I plan on going back into our share of night soon. Um, yeah, and a lot of people have been talking people. about that one so yeah i'm looking forward to actually reading that one like i'm I'm debating if once i finish blood meridian should i should i try our share of night should i do my heart as a chainsaw should i do you and only you like <laughs> uh, choose one I, I i probably will take uh you and only you <laughs> <laughs> you love your joe goldberg that lemay i i love seeing him fail <laughs> because I want nothing else for this psychopath just to fail and fail miserably and having whine about it. <laughs> <laughs> but because, I, because Santana does such a great job of doing that. <laughs> but I really hope our listeners go check the story out. And if you like it, Mariana Enriquez has some other really great like collections out there. So just give her give her a shot. Always support horror, like international horror. It's valid. Yes. It's it's sometimes more interesting than the stuff we have here. Like, it's all cultural. It's all different. It's all interesting. So it's good yeah. to get a perspective outside our typical North American horror perspective. Definitely. Yeah. But uh, Vitlame, where can listeners get in touch with you? They can get in touch with me on Twitter at Vitlame S. Also, how long is your sale going on for? Uh, it's just this weekend. Oh, so, never mind. Um, yeah. Sorry, listeners. Sorry, sorry. listeners. <laughs> um, Matt, but don't worry. About, yeah. I'm always gonna have. I'm always gonna have a sale. So don't worry. Perfect. There you go. And Matt, we're close to get in touch with you. Uh, Twitter at Brandenburg at DM. You can give me a follow at on Twitter at Rudy five thirty eighty eight, and be sure to give Abyss a follow with Adam to staring. And this is Richard Gerlach saying, keep staring. <laughs>